I have an acquaintance, <coughs> I'd say friend, it was quite mean to me. Uh, I have an acquaintance who um, lives a very rarefied lifestyle. He's a uh, mathematics lecturer, uh, an interactive fiction writer, and a published poet. Um, and this acquaintance, who we'll call Graham, because that's his name, said to me, uh, So, Alexis, you used to be a writer, and now you're this sort of wheeler dealer. H- how is that? And, uh, you know, wheeler dealer is an unkind phrase. Uh, <laughs> but I am a businessman, I'm running an independent game studio, which is rather like running a um, village of starving nomads halfway up a mountain of glass in a hurricane. Uh, So we have to conserve our resources and kill and eat those who are weak us. But I'm coming at the idea of community not from the point of view of a cannibal, but from the point of view of somebody who's both a writer and a wheeler dealer. And what I mean by that is uh, both your perspectives make sense to me. And I think the three functions of community for us, they magnify our signal, they um, share the experience we give them as a games developer with each other, and they reflect that experience back to us. So I'm going to detail in, about all of those three. The first point, Failbet has been around for about seven years now, and after about four years, we very nearly went bankrupt. Because what we've been doing uh, for the first four years um, never quite worked. It was web-based interactive fiction where people were making choices in a story that influenced the outcome of the story, which is great. And there are lots of, of uh, relatively successful interactive fiction franchises. Uh, but we hadn't quite worked our revenue model and consequently started running out of money and I started having to let people go. And as a Hail Mary last effort pass, I thought, what the hell? Let's try to make an actual video game. Uh, We have some relevant expertise, we have some relevant enthusiasm, we have some relevant uh, technical skills. Uh, How many of you know what Kickstarter is? Can you raise your hand if you know what Kickstarter is? Okay. Uh, A few not. So Kickstarter is a means of crowdfunding um, uh, projects online. It operates by the power of love. And what I found is that in the four years, I thought that we'd been failing to make any money, and then I'd been lying awake, staring at the ceiling, calculating the months or weeks of payroll I had left in the company. We'd been building up a community of enthusiasts who loved our work and wanted to see it continue. And when it came to the point of running a Kickstarter, suddenly thousands of people wanted to see us make a game set in the world that we'd been talking about for the last four years. So that was extremely I think, useful, and. Uh, community, in that sense, was as much an asset, uh, a tangible business asset, as um, uh, the money in our bank balance, uh, dwindling as it was. And it became, it, it, without that community, um, we wouldn't have managed our Kickstarter, we wouldn't have got the game funded, it wouldn't have gone to become a minor hit, and I wouldn't be here today. I'd be back working, building financial software. My soul would be leaving my body drop by drop. But the second thing that the community did They had been sharing those experiences with each other for years. So, uh, Fall in London, the interactive fiction work that Rosamond mentioned a few minutes ago, is 1.5 million words of content. Uh, It is, I think, the largest interactive fiction artefact in existence. Uh, As you obviously know, uh, London was stolen by bats in around about 1861 and dragged down under the earth, set down the shores of an underground lake where nobody died anymore. And this is inexplicably not enjoyed as much treatment in uh, uh, documentary uh, uh, works as, as you might expect. So we decided to make a game about this period in history. And uh, there are a lot of unanswered questions in among those 1.5 million words of gothic fiction about a stolen city in an underground cavern. And uh, it is uh, the work of an obsessive to comb through all that fiction and put it all together. But it is light, fun, interesting work for community. So what we found is the people were playing and reading this socially, and were putting together things they'd learned and experience they'd had. They were giving each other the different perspectives they had on the experience they'd had. They were talking about the different choices they'd made and different outcomes they'd seen. And they were interacting with, with, with each other through the game. Most online digital communities have a story or three of people who've met each other and moved in together or got married through the game. We have our share of those. We have our share of crazy, enthusiastic communities. 
people who've done fan knitwear, people who've run uh, costume parties and baked uh, cakes in the shape of uh, exceptional hats, uh, all this kind of stuff. So uh, it fucking gladdens my heart uh, that we've been able to, to bring that to the world. And that is as much a function of the community as the function of the community is keeping our business alive. And the third thing it does, to put on my uh, wheeler dealer hat a little more firmly again, is it reflects back what we've been doing and saying to us. So when we ran um, uh, the Kickstarter for London, we used our community to fine-tune our message before we unleashed it on the world. Uh, We asked them if the kind of game we wanted to make was something they'd be interested in and what we could do to make it more appealing. And they gave us extraordinarily useful feedback on it. One of the things, for example, we found was that we actually pitched it as 2D elite with steamships at Somersea. And we found that nobody who was under the age of 40 uh, or who lived in the US had any idea what elite was at that point. Elite dangerous not having norms. So we took that out of the message. Uh, and on a wider scale, something really significant has happened in game development over the last four years, I guess, five years. And that is early access, paid beaters, open development. The way that most large-scale creative works um, are made, and of course a game of any significant size is a large-scale creative work, which may have anything between one and several hundred people working on it, may have a budget of anything from hundreds to hundreds of millions of dollars. The way that most large-scale creative works are made is that you beaver away for two years or a year or three years, trying to make something, and then you launch it and you fucking hope people like it. As if not, you've lost all your money. This is why Hollywood, of course, is such a pit of screaming faces, because constantly people make films who don't know whether they're going to succeed at the last minute, famously nobody knows anything. Until very recently, this was the way that games worked, too. You had to spend extraordinary sums of money, blood, sweat, effort, ingenuity on a game, and you could focus test things, you could ask people, you could rely on research, but ultimately you had to push it out into the world and hope that it made its own way. And now uh, the trend is for companies, especially smaller independent companies like ours, to start making the game, push a prototype out to the world, and get feedback. And uh, that doesn't mean uh, that you make the game that people ask you to make. Because fundamentally, you are the people making something, and they're the people consuming it. That line can blur in interesting ways. Uh, but if they were made, the ones who were equipped to make it, they'd be making it. And uh, to quote something I keep hearing in a number of contexts, if your audience or community tells you that something is wrong with what you're doing, they are usually wrong about how to fix it. We don't know how to fix it. It's not their job to fix it. But I can hear uh, chuckles around the table. They know that it's wrong. They know that they're not enjoying it or reacting to it. It's, it's their job to know that. And the thing about starting to develop a game uh, early, putting out a prototype, getting feedback, is that you know very quickly what works and what doesn't. And there is then a considerable art and science in filtering out the nonsense, the bias, the emotion, the heartbreak because you've taken away a beloved feature from the useful feedback. Uh, but there's also a lot of utility. Also, to, to settle the wheeler dealer hat slightly more firmly again, it's very nice that people start giving you money for something you haven't actually finished yet, uh, which enables you to finish it in, in some cases. Those, I think, are the three functions of the community for, for me. And above all, as I said, indie gaming, indie game development at the moment, is pretty tough. It kind of always was. And then there was a period where it wasn't so much for a while because some tools became available that made games relatively easy to make, and certain digital distribution channels opened up and made things much easier to, distri- to distribute. So a little bit of a summer, um, and the summer is already ending. There's a lot of extremely talented studios making products and working extremely hard on, on promoting them. So it's a very competitive environment again, but having a community is what allows us to survive and hope what makes our studio sustainable. Thank you.